All right, here's a question. How do you go from being a stockbroker, a symbol of what we now call the 1%, to becoming a poet and performance artist, a symbol of the anti-war movement and the sexual revolution? Because that's the path traveled by John Giorno. And it all started back in 1962. He was working on Wall Street. One night he went to a party that would turn his life inside out. He met a pop artist called Andy Warhol, and he would find in Warhol not just a lover, but a mentor, someone to help him hone his talent as an artist and as a poet, and that's what we all want, right? Somebody who lets our inner bird sing. John was the star of Warhol's film Sleep, and if you've never seen it, it's five and a half hours of John sleeping. So, you know, that means just slightly more interesting than Twilight. Yeah. Uh, I, I did say that. In 1969, John created Dial a Poem. Here's how it worked. You called up and got three-minute hits of poetry from the likes of William S. Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, and the Black Panthers. Some were sexually explicit, others were radical. Two weeks that it's been going, we've had 70,000 calls. And Dial a Poem shook the establishment. And you know, today John's still an agitator, and he's an inspiration. When R.E.M. released their last ever single, John starred in one of two videos for the song. We all go back to where we belong. Meanwhile, his art installations continue to confront audiences. Everybody, please welcome John Giorno. Hi. Great to see you, man. Oh, good to see you. How are you? Really good. Excellent. Thanks for coming to the program. Thank you. How's the things are all right? Yes. The, um, uh, you know, if a guy's been making art for so long, does one's reasons for doing it change? N no, because you decide to be a poet from, for some inexplicable reason. I did that when I was 14 years old, and now I'm 75. I have no idea why I did this for, 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 for 60 years. Well, when I was 14, I wanted to be a poet, too. But there's this thing about when you actually realize you can be one. <laughs> when did it occur to you that you actually could be a poet? Well, something for me, I was born in New York City, and in 1960, 61, and 62, I met a lot of artists. Uh, but lots. Andy Warhol and the seven pop artists and Barbara Schoenberg and Jasper Johns. Mm -hmm. And nobody was famous. They were just young artists. And I said to myself, if they can do that, why can't I do that? And right. that's what set me on the trajectory. It's pretty incredible, though. And then, to, then when did you find your voice when you realized that you... Well, at that moment, in, in 62. So when you found your voice, was it about honing it and figuring out how to reach people? Well, in 62, I found my voice as a poet. The idea was you don't have to be dependent on a book or a magazine. You could do anything. So one of the things you listen to LP records, rock and roll. So the LP record became, LP record went on radio. And this was all poetry. And then dial a poem in 68, where the telephone you talked on, gossiped on the telephone. But why does it have to be boring gossip? And, and that, that's the, so the, then it was dial a poem on the telephone. But millions of people called because I, connected publicity to a telephone number, and, and it just went on. But something curious happened. There was the anti-war, anti-Vietnam War demonstrations that all of us and, and the weather people, and we were doing something exactly similar to the, to the Occupy Wall Street. Right. So I put lots of those things on the dial home at the Museum of Modern Art. And then one day, the, the, the weather people blew up the IBM building. Yeah. So the New York Times, the headline was on page whatever it was, call David Rockefeller's museum and learn how to blow up the IBM building. I mean, it was just, it was a similar moment right. of this energy welling up. And I happened, dial home happened to me in the middle of it that moment. Well, you, you mentioned Burroughs' name. What was William S. Burroughs like? Because this is iconic. I mean, all the guys you hung with are iconic, mythical guys, yourself included. But what was Burroughs like? He was a very kind and shy and simple and loving. Did he have all, a gun the, with him all the time? Well, he, he did, actually. <laughs> He uh, had one, uh, one in Kansas. He lived in Kansas after he left the bunker in New York there, and he kept it on his belt, loaded, uh, not loaded during the day, but he slept with it under his bed sheet on the right side, <laughs> loaded. <laughs> <laughs> because he liked guns, you know. Yeah. What about um, uh, Andy, Andy Warhol? Andy Warhol I met in 62. Again, the opposite of all those cliches, they're really kind and shy and gentle and loving, and, and, and so. And there was this idea that the cliches about these guys are, are because of the art things they're able to say. Well, it's sort of a persona. Each of them, like, like Andy was a gay man who just hated himself, but he actually had a, had a great body and a big dick. And mm -hmm. he has the Andy Warhol head sitting on top of, right. the, of, this, of this rather beautiful body. Yeah. And so, but he thinks he's ugly, so that creates, half creates what he thinks about himself, creates this myth of Andy Warhol. Was he comfortable with his sexuality publicly no, at no, that no, point? No, no, no. Andy, as you know, he was very uncomfortable, but, yeah. but uh, 
But, uh, but you were uh, when you were younger, right? Uh, yes. And so, so did, when you when you were uh, in, you know in his company, he and yours, were you guys working on how to? Because as much as New York was a really progressive mm. artistic scene, right? You, you know the rest of America what it's like. Mm. Hell, it's still like that in parts of the country. Mm. You know what what was that process like of of working through that together? Well, it, it was interesting that, that Andy was a gay man, and Bob Rauschenberg was a gay man, and Jasper Johns was a gay man, and they did not allow any gay content in their work at all. I mean, it was like, the, because it was this gay, being gay then and maybe now is the kiss of death for your career. Right. And so that was them, and that made me furious, because I come out of Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs, so that was the interesting thing, but it didn't, it didn't, they had a different agenda, and it didn't bother me. You mentioned Allen Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg's are complicated. I, people love to lionize Allen Ginsberg, mm -hmm. but then there's a lot of other stuff about him. What was your relationship like with Ginsburg? Well, I knew him all my life. So I knew him in 58 and on and all the rest. Because I think that Alan had two sides. One, he was a really great poet. But the other thing about Alan, he was a great politician. And he might have been a greater politician than, than a poet even, or whatever. Because what he did, he created the Beat Generation. I mean, Jack Kerouac would be appalled if he saw what happened in the 60s, 70s, up until now. But Alan used it very skillfully in a political way to create all of that create what ended up saying the gay marriage or create liberation or freedom with people's mind in people's minds as a poet are you are you a better poet as you get older well strangely yes because <laughs> I've, I've focused different things in my life the last 10 or 15 years I think I've written my best work really yeah our uh, 75th birthday tour. when you do a 75 birthday tour how does that feel well, I tour all the time, so they just named it here, you know, because so I, I go I tour every, every Do month. Do you hate the fact that it's your 75th birthday? No, I, I can't believe it. I'm <laughs> because when, I, when I'm old, so when, 50 or 60 years, somebody who was 75, I mean, they, you're, they, are they going to live another few months? You right. Know? <laughs> <laughs> or or everywhere. And they, they would, you, you like you like now when you get to be 90, that's yeah. what you were like when you were 60 back in the 50s or whatever. So it's just sort of amazing that I have this energy in my life and it, and it goes on. But when William Shatner was on the show, he says he thinks about death and what happens afterwards because it could happen at any time. He's 80. So you're, you're younger. Um, but do you think about the end of immortality, what comes next? I all think of it all the time because I'm a Buddhist. A Tibetan Buddhist in the Nyingma tradition and, and, and meditators. I do my meditation practice every day. And so if I should die at this moment, right. th that's the state of mind, when I, my state of mind at a moment of death. So okay, I, think I hope that's good. Well, that's good, but you, you, when, you know, when you get sort of your mind isn't in such a great shape that someday for some reason if you should die. So I think of that in that context of what is my mind going to be like right. when I die, which could be really soon. John Journal, great to see you, man. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back.